Hello and welcome to North Shore Fellowship where we celebrate Jesus as Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, and Coming King. We are glad that you have joined us today. And if you're watching on Facebook, would you click the like and share button? If you're watching on YouTube, would you share the link with a friend so that other people can find this ministry and be blessed by what God is doing through North Shore Fellowship. Let's ask a blessing now on today's service. Lord, we thank you for this technology. We thank you for this ministry. And Lord, we ask for your blessing to be on this, but we also ask for your blessing to be on all of the churches all around the world, Lord God, for we are one church working towards this ministry of reconciliation, helping you reconnect with the people you created. Father, we ask you to help us to learn from today's message. We ask you to help us to connect and be worshipful when it's time to worship. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercies never fail me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing. darkest nights you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God all my life all my life you have been North Shore. It is so good to be with you today. My name is Brian Higgins and I am about as west as North Shore West has gotten. I am recording today out in California for you, but we are continuing in our series Acts and Us and specifically today we're looking at Acts chapter 7. Now before we dive in, I want to take a moment and pray and ask God to guide our time and I'd invite you to join me in that. So Lord, we thank you that you have given us the opportunity to study your word to learn from you, and to be transformed into the image of your son, Jesus. I pray that you would guide us in this time, that you would make yourself known to us, and that we would be transformed by time spent with you. Guide us now in Jesus' name. Amen. I've noticed that whenever I tell people that I'm a pastor, particularly if I am not in a church setting, the reaction kind of falls into the same typical pattern. People get a little bit more rigid. 
They start going over the conversation to see if they've said anything that they shouldn't have said. If they've been a little bit loose with their language, now they're much more on guard about the way that they're speaking. Maybe they start asking some questions about religion. But one phrase seems to come up a lot, and maybe it's something that you've heard when you've talked with people about their relationship with God or their experience with church. There's this common phrase, if I ever walked into a church, I'd burn up or God would strike me with lightning or the whole place would burn down. It's this common thought that seems to come up and it shows that what we think is that what God really wants to do is judge people. He just wants to rid the world of sinful people. He wants to declare harsh, immediate judgment against those who are not living rightly, and maybe even us as Christians. We hang on to this idea that God is judging me harshly. He is watching closely, and he is looking for the moment where I mess up enough that he can finally kick me out of the camp. We carry this idea with us that God is harsh, and judgmental and looking to move on from us. Now, the only problem with that story is that it is not at all the way that God has interacted with his people historically. The story of God's people is nothing like this. And today in Acts chapter seven, Stephen shows us that this is not the way that God has historically interacted with his people, and it's not the way he will interact with his people going forward. What God asks of us is honesty about our brokenness and submission to his ability to fix us. So let's look at Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. We meet our main character for this chapter. It says, Then the high priest asked Stephen, Are these charges true? Now, if you were with us last week, you met Stephen in Acts chapter 6, and he is an absolutely fascinating character. In chapter 6, verse 8 tells us that he was performing signs and wonders. Verse 10 says that he was wiser when it came to speaking and debating than any of the other leaders in that day. And the specific charges that they're talking about here is whether or not Stephen was saying that Jesus was greater than Moses or the temple or the Old Testament customs that they had followed. Now, if you are a little bit familiar with Acts chapter 7, you know that we are jumping into a very long chapter today. And for a long time, I figured that Stephen was just looking at an angry crowd and decided to talk for a long time to try to not be killed by them. But really, Stephen is very deliberately moving us towards something. He's building important links between Moses and Jesus. So in verse 2, Stephen is going to begin his reply. And what he's really showing us in the first section of this chapter is how God's promises seem to look when we're looking at it through uh, our point of view. In verse 2, to this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The glory of God appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even ground enough to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no children. So this is our starting point. This is moving us back to realize Moses is not the beginning of the Old Testament story. Moses is picking up after God has already established how his patterns will look. You know, people that we know have patterns. Some are slow texters. Some are always early. Some are really good at making conversation. We notice these patterns in the people that we know. Stephen is trying to point out that God has patterns too. And the first part of that pattern is that God makes promises. The whole biblical story is about God declaring to humanity, I will make a set apart people. I will build a community that I will live with perfectly. I will draw them out from the brokenness and the sinfulness of the world, and I will establish them and settle them 
and live among them. And this is something that God always declares that he would do. This is not something that he puts on us to accomplish or he puts on us to figure out on our own. This is kind of like when a dad promises to play catch after work. That's something that he has to do. This promise of establishing his people, this is for God to accomplish, not for man to accomplish. So this is Stephen's starting point in the chapter. In verse 6, Stephen goes on. God spoke to him, to Abraham, in this way. For 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. God said afterward, or God said, and afterward, they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. So here's another interesting part of the pattern. At times, God's promises will seem very unlikely. They will have massive obstacles to overcome. Here God is plainly laying out. There will be 400 years where the descendants are, are strangers in their own, in a country that's not their own, where they're enslaved, where they're mistreated. God's promises always seem to include overcoming huge obstacles, overcoming things that people can't simply overcome on their own, which when you think of it, that's why you make a promise in the first place. No one has to promise to pass the salt to you at dinner because it's such an easy thing to do. It's so obvious, it's so simple. It's just, it's said and it's done. But something as big as creating a new community, something as big as pulling out of the brokenness of the world, that's something that God promises because it's gonna happen slowly and it's gonna happen over time. And when God establishes his people, it will include God overcoming all wrongs. He will set everything that is wrong right. He will take every broken thing and he will fix it completely. I love in Revelation 21 verse 5, God says, He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. This won't be something for us to accomplish. This will be something that God accomplishes, but he will overcome massive odds. That is part of the pattern that Stephen is trying to establish, that God's promise is something he will accomplish. It will seem incredibly unlikely. And then continuing on in verse 9, it says, But uh, because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him ruler over all Egypt and all his palace. Then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering, and our ancestors could not find food. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. After this, Joseph sent for his father, Jacob, and his whole family, 75 in all. So God's promise. You'll be pulled out of the world. You'll be pulled out of the brokenness around you, and you'll be settled in a new place. Part of the pattern. It's going to seem really unlikely. There's going to be a lot of difficulty along the way. But how will it be accomplished? A promised deliverer will arrive. In this case, we're looking at Joseph. You know, when there was a famine that threatened the very existence of God's people, Joseph was sent ahead. He was the one that was sent to make sure that life could be preserved. Here's the pattern that we have. Now, why is Stephen giving us this pattern? Because he's going to build the link that Moses steps into this pattern and points us ahead to Jesus. Let's look at what he says about Moses, and we'll do a little bit of jumping around in this section. In verse 17, it says, As the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt had greatly increased. Skip down to verse 20, and it says, At that time Moses was born, and he was no ordinary child. For three months he was cared for by his family. But when he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided he would visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. 
Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day, Moses came up to came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, men, you are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And when Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. So we're getting this big history lesson. Moses is stepping into that pattern. Just as Joseph was sent ahead to preserve the life of the Israelites, so Moses now. He, he's tying it to that promise of establishing his people. Moses is stepping into that promise. But now we get this new wrinkle. The leader is now rejected. The sent one is pushed aside. And now we have this huge question. This is the person who's supposed to fulfill the promises of God. And now this person is being pushed away. This person is being turned aside. What is going to happen then? You know, are, are the promises of God so flimsy that they can be undone with a single person? Will God simply give up at this point? We're, we're kind of left hanging for a second, but in verse 30, Stephen continues for us. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the, in the desert near Mount Sinai. Verse 32, he says, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. In verse 34, he says, I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. This is the same Moses they had rejected with the words, who made you ruler and judge? He was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He led them out of Egypt and performed wonders and signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and for 40 years in the wilderness. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. Skipping to verse 39, it says, But our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, Make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. But God turned away from them and gave them over to the worship of the sun, moon, and stars. This agrees with what was written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the wilderness, people of Israel? You have taken up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your god, Raphon, the idols you made to worship. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. So there's two important elements to see here. The first is that when Moses is rejected, God did not simply give up. God confirmed the calling of Moses. God sent Moses back to the people. But it's also important to note that as the people continued to reject Moses, God eventually gave some space for them to feel where that rejection might lead them. You know, God begins to talk about, I handed them over to the worship of the sun and moon and stars. I will send them into exile. I will hand them over. If this is really what they want, I'll let them begin to go after it. It's not that God's promises have been given up on as much as God is making space for people who want to run from him to be able to run. So how does this link to us? If we skip down to verse 51, Stephen begins to make this very personal. You have this story of continued uh, pursuit by God, but continued rejection from God's people. It all comes to a head in verse 51. Stephen says, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and your ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. You know, despite their past rejection, Stephen is really bringing everything to a head and saying, now is your time to deal with this. You are part of this long history of rejection 
and pushing God away. And now you've got to sort out, are you going to be part of that story of rejection? Or are you going to make a different choice here? You know, when I read through this story, and, and specifically thinking about how Old Testament focused it is, I know that when I think about my relationship with the church, and my relationship with the people of God, I should say, I think of it as being very church focused. And, and the church story feels very positive. You know, Jesus came down. He started it himself. It begins with his victory over death and sin, and it's just kind of an ongoing victory and expansion ever since then, or at least that's how it appears. And I think that's the storyline that I'm picking up on. But really, when we think about where we fit into the storyline of the people of God, this is our story too. We are part of this storyline of people who reject and God pursues anyway, who reject and God pursues anyway, who try to push God away, and yet who God continues to run after. This is you and me. This is the story of all of us. At one point, we were all rejectors of God, and yet God was willing to pursue us anyway and ask us, perhaps not as pointedly, but this same question, are, are we going to be like all the people before us who pushed God away? or who rejected him as well? Well, in this chapter, the answer is an unfortunate yes. In verse 54, it says, When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, here's what's so interesting to me to think about. This did not have to be their reaction. I don't believe that Stephen taught this whole sermon fully knowing that the result of it would be their rejection and ultimately his death. Because we've seen examples already in the book of Acts where some leader in the church got up, taught something very similar to this, and ended with, you know, we've rejected and we've killed Jesus, but he's risen again, and now we have to decide, are we following or are we against him? And all of those people, they were cut to the heart, the Bible tells us different moments where they turned to Jesus in massive amounts in a single day. I think that that was possible for these people. But I think that the really instructive verse is verse 57, where it says they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they rushed at him. They decided they didn't want to hear it. And ironically, they fit perfectly into the exact storyline that Stephen was telling them about. They became the people who rejected, who God still pursued anyway. Even the verse 59 and 60 to finish this chapter, it says, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against him, against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. You know, Stephen is an example of Christ-like love. Stephen is an example of loving despite rejection, and it begins to show us, even thinking about that little mention of Saul, who's going to go on to be known as Paul throughout the rest of the book of Acts and do incredible things for the, the gospel spreading throughout the world. When we see how this chapter is working, and how there's these little hints that point towards future hope, it's a reminder their rejection of Stephen is not the end of the gospel going forward. It's not the end of the storyline of God's people. God historically has allowed room for rejection and has pursued us anyway and has consistently pursued us. And that same pursuing still happens after this moment and still happens in our lives. God's main desire is not judgment. God's main desire 
is not to rid himself of sinful people. His main desire is to see sinners find hope and salvation in him. When I think about a few ways this story instructs us, when I think about how we can live differently because of it, thinking about how we have a God who pursues us despite our rejection, I think of three things. I think first, when I think through this whole storyline, it makes me think we can confidently confess our sin. We can confidently confess our sin. Church really quickly turns into a battle of appearances. You know, we try to make sure that we're looking good. We tell the stories of the good things we do. Uh, Sometimes we hear about somebody else's success that makes us feel a little bit bad. And we start kind of comparing ourselves. Where do I fit in in the spiritual rankings of this group of people? That is never what God has wanted for his people. God has always simply wanted our honesty. He's looking for people that are willing to say, you know what, Lord, I do reject you, but I need you anyway. I'm willing to stop that right now. You know, we often don't confess sinfulness because we're afraid of a bad reaction. We're afraid that people are going to look at us differently. We're afraid that we're going to face judgment. This story reminds us that that's not the way that God faces us. He doesn't begin with judgment or anger or hostility. He begins with love and care and a healing hand being extended towards us. God's response is always good when we are willing to confess our need for him. So that's one way we can live differently. We can confess sin confidently. Second, we can share Jesus unrelentingly. We can share Jesus unrelentingly. Now, what I don't mean by that is cramming Jesus into every conversation. Sometimes people will give you very clear hints or just directly say that they do not want to talk about the things of God at a particular moment. I'm not saying you just disregard their wishes and try to cram the gospel down their throats anyway. But what I do mean is that we can confidently never give up on lost people. I'm sure that we all know people where we think of them as those who will never come to believe in Jesus. I'm sure that we can think of a few people where we've just sort of written off the possibility. There's no way they will ever come to hope in God as Savior. Well, this whole storyline is about how God pursues the lost and keeps pursuing them, and keeps pursuing them, and keeps pursuing them. You know, for years I got to do youth ministry at the church that I grew up in, and One of the phrases that we always talked about with our youth students was that, uh, or with our youth leaders, I should say, is that the students we were ministering to were in a space uh, where they interacted with authority through the lens of, I hate you, don't leave me. You know, they wanted to be able to push away just to see if we would actually leave. And what they were really hoping for was that we wouldn't leave. That despite them pushing us away, they'd still be able to have us when we really needed them. Perhaps that's where a lot of people are with Jesus. They're pushing him away. They're not sure what they think about it. But if we're there when they really need them, if we're able to be there for those people and present the hope of the gospel when it is most needed, who knows what God might be able to do? There are so many examples through the book of Acts of lost people seeking out Jesus in very unlikely moments and God lovingly meeting those needs. You know, even just thinking about how this very chapter ends with the, the person who will we'll know as Paul consenting to this death, happy about it. To think about that radical transformation, how can we not unrelentingly share Jesus with those around us? So we can do those two things. We can confess sin confidently. We can share Jesus unrelentingly. And then third, we can love people unconditionally. You see, we're prone to love people as much as we feel loved by them. You know, we we love in proportion to how we are loved. We don't want to be the overeager ones. We don't want to be the annoying ones that text too much or call too early or anything like that. But we don't want to just completely underwhelm people and and totally leave them uh, neglected or something like that. You know, we're so caught up in, I want to do 
the thing that's at the level this relationship seems to require. Well, for us as believers, we can hang on to, since Jesus has loved us perfectly, we are free to love others despite their sinfulness, despite their brokenness, despite the problems that they have going on. If the whole storyline of the Bible is Jesus committing to love lost people and committing to pursue them regardless of what's going on in their lives, then we can imitate that. First, we experience it. We remember that Jesus has a committed, committed love for us. And as we experience that, we become better able to imitate that. We become better able to share that. Everything comes down to the way that we think about and experience the love of God. If we think of it as a really judgmental love, then we'll be, you know, really uptight about the things we do or don't do. We'll be really concerned about did we check the boxes or are we leaving things unchecked? We'll get all in our heads about are we performing well enough? But if we remember that Jesus has committed to loving us and gives everything possible for our good and our growth, then we'll, as we settle into that love, we'll be able to truly grow out of the grace of God, not out of some kind of obligation towards him, and we'll be able to love people in a committed and unconditional way that mirrors the way that God has loved us. We are far more loved by God than we could possibly imagine. He is far more committed to us than we might ever dream. And because of that, we can be far more radical in the way that we love those around us because that is exactly the way Jesus would want us to love. God bless you today. Thank you, Pastor. Welcome to you all. It is terrific to be with you again. Well, the weather is nice and it is time to get those summer plans in gear. So let me take you through the things that are going on. First one up is the Women's Worship Workout, 7 to 9 p.m. It will be the third Thursday of each month. So that's going to be coming up this week, July 21st. It's a bell work, so come on out and enjoy. It's going to be led by Judy Tannock and Michelle Hackworth. Ladies, come on out, get fit, dance enjoy a great time of fellowship if you have any questions or would like to let them know that you're coming you would contact Michelle at her email address I want to remind you that our Wednesday morning prayer continues with uh, Charlie Avery, our elder. That's from 6 to 8 p.m. You don't have to come for the whole thing, any portion that you can. And again, that'll be in the open courtyard area at the Bell Works building. Hey, this one is new, and you definitely want to get this one on your calendar. Saturday, July 30th, the Ocean Grows Praise Fest and All In Celebration. Now, what will North Shore be doing? We are going to be at the Ocean Grove Pavilion right on the boardwalk starting at 1 o'clock. We're going to have our worship team down there. We're going to have a great time with music. And then we're going to have a kids' table with all kinds of activities for the little ones from 1 to 5 p.m. So come on out. Now, this is part of a bigger deal that Ocean Grove is doing. That's the all-in part. So there's going to be concerts all over the, uh, the area there. And we're going to end that evening with fireworks. So go to their website. You can see all the things that are happening. Come to our website, see what we're going to be doing, but come on out and join us. That's Saturday, July the 30th, starting at 1 p.m. on the boardwalk. Hey, let's go through some of the dates that we have for the month of August. We're almost there. We want to remind you that each Saturday we're going to have an outreach at the Ocean Grove Pavilion. That's every Saturday night at 7 p.m. I want to remind you that our own Pastor Raphael is going to be teaching the Ocean Grove Bible Hour from August the 8th through the 13th. That will be 9 to 10 a.m. for that entire week. And we are planning a water baptism at the ocean. It's going to be that first Saturday, the 6th. It's going to be at 6 p.m. Now, if you are interested in baptism or being baptized, we're going to have a class about it online. It's a Zoom class on Wednesday, July the 27th. We have the link for you there at 7 p.m. But if you are interested, we'd love to know. So if you would indeed send us your information at info at northshorenj.org, we want to make sure that we get you included with that baptism that's coming up. Hey, beyond this, there is a lot of other things still going on. If you're not on our email list, you got to get on it. Send your contact information. Same email address, info at northshorenj.org. 
regular events during the week, which are even kind of special because we're in the summertime, Worship in the Word, live on the beach at 7 p.m., note the dates, on Tuesday. So come on out. There's a beach stage right next to the pier. It's very easy to find. We are still broadcasting on Facebook and YouTube Live, so you can watch that way. But if you're in the area, come on and get some sand in your toes. Come on out and join us. Now, the broadcast begins at 7, but we're there quarter after 6 or so. Bring a snack. Bring some dinner with you. We'll have some fellowship time. It's a great time. Now, there's only two left because we're only doing this for the month of July. So come on out and enjoy. Sunday online service is The Rock. They continue 9 and 10.30 a.m. Facebook and YouTube premiere. And of course, our regular Sunday services are single service summer Sundays throughout the months of July and August. That means we're going to have one live service on Sunday. It's going to be at the Bellworks building and do note the time. It is at 10 a.m. So come on out and enjoy. Well, we'd like to take an opportunity to say thank you to all of you who have just been so diligent in your financial support for the mission and work that goes on here at North Shore Fellowship. We would also like to invite all of you to come and participate that way. You can go to our website. We have a QR code. Very easy to have your donation come in. Would you join me in prayer for the offering that we will receive this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, we come into your presence and we are grateful, Father. We thank you for all that you give and provide, and we take this time now to give a portion back to you. We ask, Father, that you would take this uh, money, that you would uh, bless it, that you would direct it, and that you would uh, indeed enhance it for all that you want it to do. Father, make us wise for the work that you have for us. Direct us. Make us sensitive to know exactly what you are leading us to do. Father, we thank you and praise you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So, are you coming to any of our summer events? I hope so, because it won't be the same without you. Have a terrific week, and may God bless you all. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the worst's drought and storm. Bye.
Thanks for joining us at North Shore Fellowship Online. I hope that you were blessed today by the worship and by the word and also the announcements. There's so much going on. We're about to hit July and there's a lot going on in July. Outreaches and all kinds of events and our single service summer Sundays. And that's 10 a.m. every Sunday. Both of our locations, the Fairhaven Peninsula location and the Bellworks Holmdahl location are coming together at Bellworks every Sunday at 10 a.m. This is a perfect time for you to get off of the couch and maybe that someone that's not been in person only online, we want to see you. Also, anything that we do outside, please come and enjoy that with us. Friends, if you have never given your life to Jesus, if you're someone who's never fully said, yes, Lord, be my Lord, today is the day for that, we'll lead you in a prayer. All you need to do is reach out and let us know. For everyone, let's be blessed, let's go forward, and remember, there's power in Jesus' name. God bless you.